I first started teaching human sexuality at Brock University when the professor there who was teaching went on a sabbatical, Dr. Tony Bogart. I think you might know him. Can you talk about your relationship with Tony Bogart? Okay, I know Tony Bogart very well because he was my first postdoctoral fellow. He came to me uh, when he right after he finished his PhD, and we and he did his postdoc with me. And he had approached me because he had read the work that I had published up to that point relating birth order to sexual orientation in males. So he knew about my stuff. That's why he came to me. And we did together probably the, still the cleanest ever study of birth order and sexual orientation of males because we had like 604 individually matched heterosexual and homosexual men, 302 in each group. They were individually matched on age and I think something else. And, you know, it, it was a, a clean, clean study. And it was the first study from which uh, we were able to conclude that older brothers, but not any other class of sibling, influenced the probability of homosexuality in a male. Older biological it's, brothers. Older biological brothers. Tony later established that uh, in work that he did by himself in, I think, 2006. The work that he and I did together, we published in 1996. After the 96 paper, which got a lot of press at the time in the media, we did continue collaborating off and on, and we submitted a grant proposal in the late, like 2008, something like that, to study our explanation of why gay men have more older brothers than expected. And our explanation was that women who carry male fetuses are exposed to male-specific proteins, and that they develop antibodies to these male-specific proteins, which cross the fetal, into the fetal compartment, going the other way, back towards the fetus, and affect brain development in such a way that it increases the odds of homosexuality. Right. We first advanced this hypothesis in 96. At that time, there was actually relatively little known about male-specific proteins. But eventually, more was coming out of the lab science area. And by 2004, I listed a couple of proteins that I thought were good candidates, if the theory was true at all. And then around 2008, in that neighborhood, we started writing grant proposals to test mothers of adult gay and straight men to look for evidence that these women had had an immune reaction to male-specific proteins. The study took quite a long time to complete. We had to recruit the mothers and develop the assays and whatnot. But I'm happy to say that we finally got our results and we published about a week and a half ago. Right. And that's why I wanted to bring that up. Truly groundbreaking. I literally never thought I would live to see anybody do that study, let alone that I would be part of it. So it's been, you know, a, a huge pleasure to me that we got that far. It doesn't mean I'm gam that doesn't mean I'm saying hundred percent it'll replicate. Who knows? Not every study that looks like a great breakthrough replicates. But I've got a pretty good feeling about this one. And as I say, I never thought I would live to see this study because these proteins weren't even known when Tony and I first started theorizing about maternal immune responses to male specific proteins. So how did you then come to hypothesize about these particular proteins? I would read the biological literature, which I really had no formal preparation for. But I was reading immunology papers, and I could maybe understand 1% of the content of those papers. But in that 1% would be the thing I needed. And around 2003, uh, an article came out, an immunology article, that really had a lot of new information about genes on the Y chromosome and what substances they encoded. And, and it produced a table of all of these proteins and what was known about where they were expressed and at what time they were expressed. So I was able to get to a short list of three that were expressed in fetal brain and not a lot elsewhere. And so that was our short list. We hired an immunology consultant when we started the grant and she said one of the three on the list couldn't be right. I said, okay. So that left us with the two that we tested. I'm guessing it's not that all gay men have more older brothers. So in that case, are we talking about 
different pathways to homosexuality or do they still experience the same type of, for whatever reason, development? What are your thoughts on that? It's possible there's some final common pathway, but I think it's almost certain that upstream from that final common pathway, there are different different events that lead to homosexuality. And the maternal immune reaction, I think, only accounts for somewhere between 15 and 30 percent of gay men. And there must be other things that initiate that course of development. And then this is just a random question, but it seems related to it And as I'm hearing you talk. I mean, the current figures, uh, which are taken from probability samples that are less likely biased data, the current figures indicate that if the guy is a identical twin and he's gay, the chances that his identical twin brother are gay are between 20 and 25 percent. So it's significantly higher than if his twin is a fraternal twin, but still is way, way less than the 100 percent it would be for genetic diseases where you have, you know, some major gene of strong effect. Right. So there's a lot to explain there that's not genetic. You asked me if this could be because identical twins are not 100% identical in terms of genes. That is true, but my understanding is that most of the discrepancy is in non-coding parts of the DNA. Okay. You know, so you know the discrepancy in number of of uh, differences is is not as big as it sounds because most of that is is in junk DNA that doesn't do much of anything. Okay. So you know that that leaves a lot to be explained besides genes. And I think that the fraternal birth order uh, business, the maternal antibodies, are one of those additional things. What are your hypotheses as to why it's not higher rates of concordance? Uh, it's a really good question. And, I, you know, I've been asked about it recently. Uh, the only literature I ever could think of to look at that would be relevant is what happens if the mother is exposed to something that's known to cause birth defects, like an infection or some toxic substance. There's not a lot of, well, the last time I reviewed the literature was around 2004, so there's probably a lot more now. But the, 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 the stuff I reviewed in 2004 indicated that if a woman is pregnant with twins and is exposed to something that normally causes a birth defect or something like a birth defect, it doesn't always identically affect both twins. Right. You know, there are differences in monozygotic twins. I forget all the different variations, but they can be in the same amniotic sac. Sometimes they're not in the same amniotic sac. One twin might have a bigger section of placenta than another one. To say they're, they're in the same womb sounds like they're in the same environment, but no two individuals can be in the same environment. Right. You know, right. They're in very similar environments, but who knows how much difference it makes to cause one canalized pathway versus another one. Right.